Well, it's just about noon, so I think we can start our Facebook Live today. And I'm going to try to not sound reactionary, because I have to admit, I'm a little bit upset today. Um, I received a lot of emails yesterday from women who received inappropriate care for inflammatory breast cancer. And I have been writing people back, but I thought maybe if I address it here in a larger form, we can share this information and do good things. Um, what I want to cover today is a little bit about the unevenness of standard of care and since it's open enrollment time to mention some things there and also a common question I'm getting is what is an IBC specialist? And that question has been prompted due to a very sensitive issue where a woman was treated by a doctor who told her he was a specialist. It was actually listed on his uh, hospital website and unfortunately she received the wrong standard of care. And I don't want to get too much into that, but it made people ask, what is an specialist? How do you know your doctor is a specialist? And so those are some things I want to address. And I know many of you probably aren't here live with me right now, and you can look at this later and you can share it. So let's start with the unevenness of standard of care. One of the big issues about IBC is this is a rare disease. And the standard of care has been clearly outlined by the National Cancer Institute. You can go on their website and you can read about it or even you look at the IBC International Consortium. Now, the consortium only formed about 10 years ago, but the standard has been laid out for a very long time. And the standard of care is that a woman or the man, because men do get IBC as well, will have chemotherapy, usually six months of it, and then you'll have a non-skin sparing mastectomy with no plans at that time for reconstruction. Here's where the things seem to go the most wrong. And what happens is sometimes they will give them expanders and take away minimal amounts of skin. I'm going to move this because it's looking shaky to me. I've lost my tripod there. Anyway, so what happened is that we see with reconstruction is where things go the most wrong because they'll do it at the mastectomy. Sometimes they'll say, well, you're young and you're strong and you can be fine and you can have this reconstruction. Those papers that you're referring to are older. And so kind of follow the rabbit trail here on me with this a little bit. IBC is rare and there's not much research. The standards don't change much because there's no reason for them to change much. So when your doctor tells you, well, that paper is 10 years old, nothing maybe has changed in 10 years. That is what the problem is. Okay, and the consortium meets every other year. And then in the in-between years, they meet at San Antonio at the biggest press conference in the world and discuss, like they did just a few weeks ago, to see if they need to update anything. So they are meeting and actively discussing needed updates. A couple of years ago, at the 10th anniversary of the Morgan Walsh Clinic in Houston, Texas, they had a new consensus where there was some discussion about nodal bypass and various things like that to help bring in more conversation, but the standard wasn't changed. When they met a few weeks ago, the standard wasn't changed. So just because a paper appears to be older doesn't mean it's not been revisited and it is not current. Um, the standard of care for IBC, let me back up, is that what the woman or the man will get probably six months of chemotherapy and then a non-skin sparing mastectomy. Very important because the skin has cancer in it. That skin has got to go away. It's not your friend. And so that chest wall should be as tight as a drum. But what happens is sometimes a doctor will say, well, we can go ahead and not do such an aggressive a mastectomy, we can leave a little skin, we can put in an expander, and technically some people view that maybe thinking that's what they mean by delayed reconstruction. That is not what we mean for IBC. Because what happens is now your expander has a life of its own. It has its own timeline that has to be filled or things like that or could get infected and things like that. Now here you are, you're needing to get um, the radiation. Radiation is going to uh, harden that skin uh, with that expander, and it's going to be prone to tear when you go to get the fills. So that is something you have to think about. And also, too, one of the reasons you get an expander is you want to attract a breast mound, and you're not going to have that with a radiated breast because that breast is going to be charred to a certain extent. And also, a wound, these like don't tend to heal well. So the reason the standard is there is to not compromise by leaving skin to not compromise by what could be a delayed um, getting you into um, radiation due to maybe an infection or a timeline that now has to be considered with your new expander. So the mastectomy is where we see things go the most wrong because we you see doctors all the time telling women, oh, it's fine, those are old papers, you can have an expander, we do this all the time. Well, chances are they don't do it all the time on someone who has IBC. 
and then you move into radiation. This unevenness of the standard of care is something that seriously compromises women's health, and it's something that needs to be seriously addressed. We've actually um, sent some risk management letters out to hospitals. We have learned they have done the wrong standard of care for IBC. The patients have no idea this is controversial, and this needs to be considered. Um, so you need to look at the IBC network. We have uh, the standard of care laid out, as well as the National Cancer Institute, and any credible organization about inflammatory breast cancer or about breast cancer in general will talk about the needs of delayed reconstruction. So FYI, an expander is not delayed reconstruction. You can have reconstruction after, say, a six-month or one-year window. For many reasons, you need to delay. But they all involve a flap, either a tram or a um, deep or the different flat versions of reconstruction because they are actually having to create a breast mound. Uh, recently I heard from a lady that unfortunately the doctor basically just removed the nipple, took skin from the tummy, and told her it was a deep. And FYI, that was not a deep. And she unfortunately instantly reoccurred. And if I can do anything to prevent that to happening to somebody else, it would mean the world to me. Unevenness of standard of care. Think about it. It's very important. And unfortunately, often patients will tell me, well, my doctor tells me that they all go to the same conferences. Well, they do. And guess what? IBC isn't presented at breast cancer conferences. It's rare. Rare disease are not presented. So if they tell you we all go to the same conferences, unfortunately, for this disease, it doesn't have much bearing. So it's really important. I hate to put the burden on the patient, but sometimes we have to when it's a rare disease. And by the way, I think most doctors and nurses, anyone in the health field, is doing the best they can. They mean good things for us, but unfortunately we know that sometimes things go wrong. So learn about the standard of care. That has led me to uh, put a letter on the IBC network that you can share with your insurance company because we find that many women can't go to a specialist because their doctors, um, their insurance will not allow them to leave their immediate area. And maybe they live in a remote area and there's not an IBC specialist there. And I'm looking over at my notes here because there's some terms that insurance companies talk about, about allowances or recognized amounts for rare diseases. And we don't think that this letter is going to have an immediate impact. But we hope it can start the conversation to allow a patient who has a rare disease leave their local community with some kind of special consideration or allowance to help cover the need. So at least they can get a good quality second opinion and then go back and maybe have the care carried out in their local community. And everybody wins from that. So that letter is on our website. If you need help with that, let us know. Um, so open enrollment also gets back into the idea of specialists. Open enrollment is going on right now until, um, I forgot the date, I've got it on my calendar. It's extended for California. Um, so you've got some time to look into it. It's on our website. Um, open enrollment, you know, you may want to go on the Affordable Health Care Act and buy your insurance or maybe do it through your private company. But patients are finding out that they can't see if they can go to a specialty clinic until after they purchased it. So one thing that we did is we pulled up the, the three IBC specialty clinics as well as a special nod to one doctor in Chicago, Krista Finale, who also is considered to be a world expert. And we want you to see what insurance those hospitals take. So you can kind of like team tag it. You look at what your insurance says you can do, then go back and then look at what the specialty place can do. So you can either go to Dana Farber Duke or MD Anderson and see that um, your insurance will be accepted. And that way you don't have a surprise come January 1st. We unfortunately know of many women who are having to quit clinical trials come January 1st because their insurance changes will not allow them to continue with the specialty clinic. And so you can see why these letters about the accepted allowance for rare disease is extremely important. So we hope some of this information that we're putting out for you is important. Now, back to what I opened with that's got me a little bit upset about the specialists. How do you know someone's a specialist? How do you know what a trimodal clinic it is? Well, Dana Farber, MD Anderson, and Duke all have listed on their websites they host a trimodal clinic. And the reason I mentioned Krista Finelli in Chicago, Northwestern does not list that on their website but we know he is viewed as the leading world expert and he's the head of the consortium. So we always bring him into the conversation because he's definitely important of influence. But we do not feel comfortable listing Northwestern as a specialty clinic since they have not listed that on their own website. So I hope you understand that little caveat there. Now, what makes someone a specialist? Well, maybe someone is treated a lot of IBC at their hospital. Or what I heard one place referred to their practice as, you know, Dr. Bob Jones was the specialist. 
Well, what it was is he was the one out of the four of them who treated the most. So he was their specialist. He wasn't an IVC specialist. I hope you can understand that slight difference that is hugely important. An IVC specialist is someone who's doing research, is how we view it. They're actually doing research on the disease so they understand the unique needs. And you can find them by their publications. Uh, they tend to be at one of the three trimodal clinics we mentioned and also at Northwestern. The, um, they are the oncologist and the radiologist and the surgeon. And they are all conducting research and they're all working in a team. They call it trimodal care. So you're not just kind of like going through the phone book and picking a surgeon. Like, you know, you, I saw an oncologist. He says, hey, go get your, your favorite surgeon. These three uh, disciplines are working together to make sure no balls get dropped because IBC has unique care, unique follow-up, and hopefully we can make, uh, avoid some of the mistakes we see this happening in reconstruction at uh, the wrong time. And um, so we're hoping that if some of these resources will be helpful for you. So if you can go on the IBC Network website, you'll find things about the unevenness of standard of care and why it's important that you know because it's definitely risking um, your life more than the disease is already not done enough. We don't want any more risk factors added. We don't want any healing problems added. We don't want anything to compromise your care. And also we want to educate the doctors who might not know there's something different. Also the insurance issues are huge. And so if this letters can help you by um, sending a um, reminder to your local insurance company, especially people who live in really small communities where maybe access is really difficult um, because maybe you live in you know a really small town in the middle of Montana and the nearest center is six hours away and they probably don't have an IBC clinic, it could be reasonable to allow them, for them to allow you to have a special consideration to go to one of the three local clinics that are IBC specialists and then you take that information back home. And then also, too, we hope you think about what is a specialist. And we don't want you to feel if you can't come to a specialist that you're doomed because we see wonderful care given in small towns. But we hope you will encourage your doctor to touch base with one of the trimodal clinics. And that doesn't mean maybe one of the major centers in California or maybe one of the major centers in New York. If that's not a trimodal clinic, it may not be all that you expect it to be. So please encourage that kind of network. It will help us all in the long run. And I hope that some of this information is helpful to you because we want to do everything we can to make it as good as possible for the women who have IBC and the men who have IBC and all the families involved and all the teams who are trying to help us because at the end of the day, we're all trying to get to a really good place. We want to be healthy and well. So that's it for now. If you've got some questions, give me a shout and hope always.